tomorrow the next service is to give you an opportunity to come forward and get prayer and have some things broken off of you all. And if you want more tea, then from the place of worship, from the environment of worship, in the atmosphere of worship, your faith is lifted when God begins to, to break through into your perspective. The things that you thought were impossible about a moment ago suddenly don't seem quite as hard.
the Holy Spirit. I need the confidence of the Holy Spirit. I need the strength of the Holy Spirit. I need His power to break so smooth off of me. I need Him. I need Him. And God, I need people. Even if I can say I want to be here without a desperate need for the Holy Spirit, I am still desperate for a fresh encounter with the living God. To give me a fresh baptism in the fear of the Lord. To give me a fresh reminder of how holy He is.
to be sending a shipment of clothes ages 4 to 14 to the SOS orphanage in Osawam, Ghana. You can purchase clothes for donation or for your daily use hand-me-downs. Just drop them at the information booth for the next two Sundays and we'll send them off to Ghana. Here are the current opportunities. We are adopting a member of our community who lost everything in the apartment fire and destroyed her building on September 1st. If you have more than one of something, but the extra one is something you would want, if you are building your electric from scratch, please add to the form. Let's help this sister get back to her feet. Make sure you scan the QR code. In partnership with San Francisco City Impact, bring love, encouragement, and relationship to some of San Francisco's most isolated residents. You can serve next week, Sunday afternoon, September 25th. Sign up via QR code history. Visit GTFC.org slash donate to become a partner of and go ahead and tap on the ministry that you are interested in, and it will directly send you to the sign up form. Good morning, Glad Dragons. My name is Vanessa. Right. We just have one more thing we want to tell you today, and that is next Sunday is Visitor Sunday. Now, I want you to know what that means. Sometimes in the past, that has meant bring all of your friends on Sunday.
but you will not be able to watch it in your cozies at home because virtual church isn't really church, my family. Can you imagine virtual family? <laughs> yeah, when you say it was virtually family, that means it wasn't family. It was almost family. Virtual church isn't church. It's almost church, but it's not church. Now, if you have no other way to get here, there's, there's no judgment. But some people are taking advantage of this, and they're actually, they, they are going to church service, but they don't actually have a church. And I want everybody who's part of God Tidings to have a church. You can, you can actually attend in person every Sunday and still not have a church. We'll talk more about that later. In fact, I'm going to talk a little bit about that this morning. Because what we've been talking about this, this last year, really, if I look at the messages from the last year, all of them are about what it means to follow Jesus, what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. Say the word disciple. I don't want a church full of attenders. I want a church full of disciples. I say this all the time. If we have a church full of attenders, all that means in San Francisco is going to be filled with people who represent Jesus poorly. Only if we have a church full of disciples, when you go out there and tell people you're a Christian, it's not going to cast shade on who Jesus is. I think the word is throw shade, not cast shade. I'm not really on my toes when it comes to slang. So... During some of these messages, and especially a couple of weeks ago, as we talked about what it means to be a disciple, the message kind of crosses over into the subject of what it means for us to be the church, what it looks like, what it represents, what our life together as the church is in God's eyes, and what it's actually supposed to look like in reality. And as we do baptisms, again, at the end of this service,
that the law of heaven is the power of the Holy Spirit to undo or reverse those things that generally don't happen according to the laws of this world. To bring healing where there's sickness, even terminal sickness. To bring freedom to a people who are oppressed. So we touched on this first point briefly a couple of 
weeks ago, and we're going to dive a little bit deeper today. The first thing that we learn from the Bible about who the church is, and I've said it a few times already so far, is that the church is a family. Say the word family. Family. Thank you. Is there a sister Peter is going to do in just 
a couple chapters. But he says, um, God, you know, last thing I heard about Saul is that he's the one who's been terrorizing your church. You, 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 you talk about the same Saul? And God says, go. And so he goes. And when he gets there, the first words out of his mouth are, Brother Saul. The Lord Jesus appeared to me to send me to you so that you might be saved and filled with the Holy Spirit. He goes in a moment from being the enemy of the church to being brother Saul. In a moment. If we look at the books of Romans, Corinthians, Galatians, Philippians, the other letters of Paul, Peter, James, John, Jude, in every single one of these books, except for 2 Timothy, Titus, and Jude. And in Jude, he calls them dear friends. In Titus and 2 Timothy, he's writing to one person. And so he's not, he doesn't need to call people brothers and sisters. He says, my beloved son, actually. So there is a family title in this letter. But if you look at all these letters, you will find that the writer is calling them brothers or sisters or children of God. Which, if I'm a child of God and you're a child of God and I'm saying children of God, that means brothers and sisters. When we get into the teachings of Jesus, we find the same thing, this family dimension of our relationships that gets even more serious. Jesus said some things that would have been totally shocking to the Jews who lived back then about family. And they actually still are totally shocking. We're in cultures today where family ties are absolutely number one in importance. Jesus said in Luke 14, 26, listen to this. If anyone comes to me and does not hate their father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. I would think a handful of people might have walked away at that point. Now, I have chosen this translation for shock value. Because the Greek word Messiah here would have been understood to mean this. And if you look in our translation that we're reading together, the New Living Translation, it will say something like this. If you don't love me so much more than them, if they are not in such second, sorry, such distant second place compared to me, then it's almost as though you could say you hate them in comparison to the way you love me. That's what this means. But it still would have been shocking to use that word to make that point. In another place, Jesus is teaching in a house that's so crowded that nobody else can get in. Somebody tells him, hey Jesus, your mother and your brothers are waiting outside. They want to talk to you. And he replies to the people in the room, who is my mother? Who are my brothers? That would have been so offensive. So offensive. That's like, I can't even go there. And what he says to them is, here are my mother and my brothers and my sisters. Anyone who does the will of my father is my brother and my sister and my mother. He says, don't let anyone call you rabbi, for you have only one teacher and you are all equal as brothers and sisters. And don't address anyone here on earth as Father, for only God in heaven is your Father. He's redefining everything for them in this culture where loyalty to the family is the number one value. Jesus redefines the family as those people who are his followers and who are committed to doing his wills. So the line of my loyalty divides right through any other relationship and it connects directly to the church because we together are unified in our submission and our following in the Lordship of Jesus. Amen? Amen. Now, I have taken so much time to go through these examples of family in the Bible because this is extremely challenging yes. to us who live in a culture that is so individualistic. We are so afraid of making commitments, and we're even worse at keeping our commitments. 
talk more about that in a minute. Some of us are from cultures where family is the absolutely the number one. And if you cross family, you're disowned. There are countries today where if you become a Christian, you are not part of the family anymore. Not because the church won't let you be part of your family, but because your family won't let you be part of your family. Because you have crossed the line of family loyalty by leaving the family religion. And therefore, you have broken the number one cultural value, which is family. So some of us in this room are from cultures like that. I have bumped up against some of that in, in counseling people who are from these cultures. And they're like, I don't know what to do because God's telling me to do this. But I'm afraid of what my family will do. And they, some of them have paid a hard price when they did what God told them to do. But for many others of us, probably for most of us, the bigger challenge is our individualism. We don't want to be accountable to another group of people for what we think, say, do, and how we act. But that's what God is calling us to. So that's going to take us to the next picture that the Bible gives us of the church. And this one is challenging in different ways. And that's the, the, the image, the illustration, the metaphor of being a bride, as in bride and groom in a wedding. The church in the New Testament is depicted, is pictured as the bride of Jesus. Now, it's an illustration. Some people have taken this way too far. They have come to church in wedding dresses. They also add a sword and combat boots to it because we're the warrior bride of Christ doing spiritual warfare. I oh, think you, never mind, never mind. I'm not going to go there. It's an illustration. The point is to get the meaning, not to put on a wedding dress. It's a powerful symbol. It immediately communicates something to us. It's an image packed with that meaning. Amen? So for readers of the New Testament, the image of a bride, more, way more so back then than now, it would have symbolized purity and consecration. Consecration is just a fancy word that means set apart for one purpose, reserved for only one use. It's like the china dishes that you only take out when the most esteemed, honorable guests come to your house. We don't even have china dishes. Some, some of y'all don't even know that anymore. Because we don't have china. When a marriage was arranged, which they all were back then, the family of the husband would always ask if the woman had been with another man. And if she had been, she was considered impure, and that would very often end any discussion about a possible wedding to their son. Now, there, uh, I want to go off ta on tangent here about patriarchy, but that's okay. We're not going to do that. Because it's a metaphor, and it means something to us today. In the same way, it means that we are meant to be set apart for God's own use. We are consecrated to Him. That's essentially what the church word holy means. It means we are absolutely set apart to God and for God and for no other use. For His purposes only. When you get married, you are making a covenant. Now, covenant is another word that we have almost no understanding of today. Not just because we don't know what it means, but because we don't know how to do it. We live in a culture where keeping our commitments is seen as optional. If we tell someone we'll do something, we'll really mean, oh, we'll do it if it ends up working for us. I'll do it if I get to it. If we tell someone we'll be somewhere, we mean we'll be there unless something else comes up. When we tell someone that we'll be faithful to them, we really mean that we'll make some sort of modest attempt not to cheat on them. That's what we mean by commitment these days. When we get married and make vows to never leave a person, what we really mean is that we'll stay married until it gets too far. That's not a covenant. The covenant of marriage, and i got to stop and i got to say, this is not, you 
cannot take this and tell yourself, I have to stay in this marriage when I'm being abused. You can't do that. And people have done that for centuries and they have to stop right there. If you are being abused, if your spouse is cheating on you, you do not have to stay in that marriage. God does not want you to suffer that way for the sake of what I'm describing as covenant. But for most of the rest of us, we need the other side of this. Right? The covenant of marriage is an unbreakable covenant. When I said I do to my wife on October 2nd, 2004, which is 18 years ago and exactly two Sundays, I was making a commitment never to break my commitment. That is what a covenant is. There's an easy definition to remember a hard word. A covenant is a commitment not to break your commitment. If you break it, it was never a covenant in the first place. And when you get baptized, raise your hand if you know you're already getting baptized today. Some of you might put your hand down later.
Romans 12, 4, 5 says, For just as each one of us has one, or sorry, just as each one of us has one body with many parts, many members, and these parts do not all have the same function, so we in Christ, though we are many people, we form one single body, and each member belongs to all of the others. That scripture takes some processing. <laughs> you belong to each other, according to the Lord God Almighty who made the heavens and earth. He says, you're not your own, you belong to me, I bought you with the price. And part of what he paid for was that we would belong to each other, that we would be accountable to each other, that we would encourage each other, that we would show hospitality towards each other, that we would one another up, forgive one another, bear one another's burdens, that we would be family to one another. But when he says you belong to each other, that's like saying your hand belongs to your arm in this illustration. Now you can cut off a relationship with a brother, sister, mother, father, or even a child or a parent. But I don't know how many people can get in a fight with a part of their own body and cut it off. Now, I know that Vincent Van Gogh cut off his ear and did some weird stuff with it, but he had gone insane from drinking too much absinthe. Which is illegal these days, so hopefully that's not you. This is one of the illustrations that the Bible gives us that is most challenging again to us because of our individualism in our culture. A body that is not in unity, a body that is not living in a state of connectedness, is either bleeding, dying, or dead. Depending on which part of the body is missing and for how long, right? That's the only difference between bleeding. Dying or dead, just which part is missing. But we as a church are called to depend on each other's gifts, each other's commitments, our relationships with one another, and our contributions to our life together. We are called to be just as dependent upon one another to do what God has called us to do. As the parts of your body are dependent on one another to get your body to do whatever you want it to do. That's how dependent we are supposed to be on one another. Amen. If your hands, your arms, your legs, your back, and your feet do not cooperate with your will right now, if you want to get up and take a walk around, you're not going anywhere. Right? You kind of need all of those to get up. Actually, you need your abdominal muscles too. That's okay. We're not, this isn't a physiology lesson. It's an illustration. <laughs> and in the same way, if the Lord, who is the head of the body, it's not an if he is. The scripture says he's the head of the body. If the head of the body says to the body, that's us, I want you to put my love on display to one another, to the city and to the world.
to say in the house. If we're ever going to be that and do that, then every part of the body has to function as God created it to function. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 16 says that the way the whole body grows and builds itself up in love is only as each part does its work. So if some part's not doing its work, we're not getting built up in love and growing into what God has called us to be. Last one. We touched on this before in the last few weeks as well, but we're going to go a little deeper today. The church is referred to as the temple of God. This is true of you as an individual, if the Spirit of Christ lives in you, as Paul would say. But it's emphasized much more often. It's only one time in the New Testament does it say you individually are the temple of God. But multiple times it says we together are the temple of God. There's a scary warning on that one, by the way. It says if anyone destroys this temple, God will destroy you. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I don't know why I said that. It's the Bible. Take it up with God. In the Old Testament, the temple is the place where God's Spirit dwells. It was the place where heaven intersected with earth. In other words, it was heaven's embassy. We talked about that. It was the place where people encountered God. It was the place where God said He would meet the people, where God would speak to the people, and He would give them His instructions for their lives. It was the place where people were made right in their relationship with God. It was the place where the fire of God flashed down from heaven and burned on the altar, which symbolizes the place where God would take away sins, but also the place where His Spirit was living. In the New Testament, Peter says that we, as living stones, are being built into a temple where God dwells by His Spirit. So everything that was true about the Old Testament temple is now true about us. We are the place where heaven intersects with earth. This is the place where God will meet with people, where God
we are capable of doing all the things that I just mentioned is because we are filled with God's Spirit. We are being built up as living stones into a temple where God dwells by His Spirit. That is what makes us the temple of God. This building without God's Spirit in it is just concrete steel, plaster, and wood. It is dead. It is absolutely dead. It's inanimate. Without God's Spirit in us, we are just flesh and bone, spiritually dead and destined to die. But with God's Spirit in us, and as we realize what God has called and equipped us to do, nothing will be impossible for us because if His Spirit is in us, nothing is impossible for Him. These are the words of Jesus, by the way. This isn't my deduction. He said, nothing will be impossible for you. And then, why should this be surprising? It's the same Jesus who said, when you go out in the power of the Spirit, not even the gates of hell will be able to stand against you. And so I say to you this morning, church, this is who you are. It's who God says you are. It's not who I say you are. It's not what you look like either. No. It's not what I look like. But it's who God says we are. It's what we are capable of doing by the power of His Spirit. Oh, we can't do it. There is no doubt in my mind. You look around the room and okay, I can't do it. Can you do it? No, can you do it? No. But by His Spirit, we can do anything that He calls us to do. That is an important part. We're not called to do everything. We're not called to save the world. We're called to do what He has called us to do. And it may involve parts of all those things I just mentioned. Or He may call us to something completely different. It's not about how big it is. It's about that we do what He says to do. And I certainly think it'll be big because when He calls us to do it, it's going to require the power of His Spirit to do it. I'm challenging you this morning to see yourself not just as an individual, but as this church. I'm challenging you to see yourself as God sees you. And if you're getting baptized today, oh, I lost one. I'm calling you to live what your baptism symbolizes. You are joining a family. You are making an unbreakable commitment to be loyal and faithful to the Lord of this family. And if he's all of our Lord, that means we're loyal and faithful to one another too. Unbreakable commitment. You are consecrating your life. You are setting your life apart for God's exclusive Use. First Corinthians 6, 19, I'll say it again. It says, you are not your own. You were bought with a price. So you must honor God with your life. You are a living stone. And you are being built together with every single one of us to be a temple where God dwells by His Spirit. You are joining a body, and if you don't do what God has called you to do in this body, we can't do what God has called us to do. Not one of us. You are making a covenant that in our life together, we become the place where heaven intersects with earth, which means you need to have faith and expectation when you walk in here that anything is possible. Because the laws of heaven will override the laws of earth when we come together as two or three where people encounter the spirit of the living God, where they come because, or they come to life because of the gospel of Jesus Christ, where they are filled with the power of the Holy Spirit, where their lives are transformed, where their bodies are healed, where their chains are broken, where their hearts are mended, where their relationships are restored, where every need is met. That's the commitment. If you want to back out and think about it, that would be the responsible thing to do if you're like, oh, well, then I want to sign up for all this. Don't do it if you're not signing up for it. I would much rather have awkward silence when we invite people to come up and get baptized than you to come and commit 
into something and you don't know what you're doing. Amen? Amen. Okay, if you're, getting, if you're still getting baptized, go ahead and line up. For those of us who are watching, one person, oh, that's Pastor Chelsea. You can get baptized. Oh, no, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. For those of us who are watching what comes next and celebrating these baptisms, because it is awesome to celebrate, and especially those of you who have already been baptized and consider yourselves followers of Jesus and members of his church, whether it's this one or another one, I'm challenging you to participate in this moment as a covenant renewal ceremony. Some of you have been to a wedding, maybe, where they invited any married people in the, in the, the, the gathering to renew their vows to each other as the married couple is saying their vows to one another, to repeat vows all throughout husbands and wives who have been gathered. I'm asking you to do that right now with your vows and your commitments to Jesus and everything that I just talked about to be consecrated to him, to be part of the body that he calls to do his will here in the Fillmore and Western Edition and Cathedral Hill. We're, we're in the middle of nowhere. What are we? Cathedral Hill, Japantown, Western Edition, Hayes Valley, Fort we're everywhere. Lower not Bill? No, we're not on him. Renew your commitment to the Lord to be part of this body that he has specifically placed in this location to put his love on display to the people around you and to the people around us. And if it, to be part of a body, to be committed to him as a bride, to be committed to one another as family, and to be committed to the presence of heaven on earth as a temple. Amen? Amen? Amen. We're going to start a little bit of worship as they get settled. Last time we realized we couldn't get words and baptism on the screen at the same time, and so we advanced technologically. I will see it come. 
It's not Isaac again. <laughs>
the Holy Ghost. Yes. 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 yes.